for me, the most special ESA mission ever. I think it's, um, it's going farther out. Uh, it's completely from ESA. So we're going to use an European uh, rocket. We're going to use an European satellite. Most of the experiments are European. So um, it's really, really special for the European space flight. Um, maybe you can introduce yourself. What is your uh, function here at Airbus? What are your functions here for JUICE? Yeah, okay. So my name is Cyril Cavell. I am the project manager for Airbus. So I am running the overall project for Airbus on behalf of ESA. And we are also managing uh, a set of, let's say, an industrial consortium with a lot of industrial partners all around Europe and also in the US a bit. We have approximately 80 subcontractors working uh, with us on this uh, on this fantastic mission, uh, and we are effectively very proud in Airbus to be managing this mission for ESA. This spacecraft is probably one of a lifetime um, <laughs> thing. I mean, um, maybe there will be something else because Juice is going to find something really, really special uh, under the Galilean moon. But um, maybe you can tell me something that in your career is completely special on this uh, kind of satellite. <laughs> well, for, for me, it is the first uh, development project uh, that uh, I will have run from the beginning to the end. So effectively, having seen the very early design phases of a spacecraft, we started the project in 2015, so it's already a long time ago. Uh, and seeing now the, the satellite fully assembled, almost ready to be shipped to the launch site and then to be launched on board Ariane 5 to Jupiter, it's really an, an amazing journey for me and for the whole team, having worked uh, for years on this fantastic project. It's almost finished. I think um, on April it's going to launch with the Ariane 5 from Kourou. Um, so the final step. So um, we walked a little bit around uh, the spacecraft. Some of the instruments are not uh, attached to the spacecraft, but it's almost finished. Um, what are the next major steps that maybe take sleep from you. <laughs> yeah. So almost everybody is on board now. In, in, in particular, on the instrument side, we have uh, all instrument uh, flight models integrated on the spacecraft. Uh, what we do at the moment, we are close to the end of our, what we call AIT, assembly integration and test phase. So we do a lot of uh, what we call mission tests. These are system level closed loop tests that we do in order to exercise the spacecraft and the functional behavior of a spacecraft in flight representative conditions, simulating the most complex phases of a mission, like launch, separation, insertion at Jupiter, science phase around Ganymede, for example. And we also inject a number of failures onto the spacecraft to verify that even in case of failure, the spacecraft can, can, can uh, recon detect these failures, reconfigure from these failures, and continue the nominal mission. So this is really the purpose of what we do at the moment. After that, there will be a complement of thermal vacuum tests. So it is a test uh, in which we put the spacecraft inside a vacuum chamber. Uh, we, um, we, we simulate uh, vacuum and temperature conditions representative of what the spacecraft will see in flight. And it is a test that we use to verify that in these flight representative conditions, all functions, all hardware, the software is behaving nominally, let's say. Then there will be some uh, final activities to prepare the spacecraft for shipment. We will reinstall the solar array that you cannot see there. They are not installed at the moment. This is typically one of the last things that we will do just before going to Kourou. And then finalization on, on multi-layer insulation blankets of a spacecraft, a few cables to be connected. We place the spacecraft in a big container and we ship to Kourou. Mm. You mentioned the uh, thermal vacuum tests. Um, I think JUICE uh, went to ESA, to the Netherlands, but the final uh, vacuum tests are done here, right? Yes. So we have, we have done effectively a first uh, thermal balance and thermal vacuum test at ESTEC last year, uh, in June 2021. Uh, uh, we, have, we have been at ESTEC in, in the large space simulator for one main reason. This is the only space in Europe where you can simulate the kind of flux that the spacecraft will see when going very close to the sun. One particular thing about JUICE is that before going to the outer part of the solar system with Jupiter, we will go first in the inner part of the solar system, in particular around Venus, in order to collect progressively the kinetic energy that we need to get to Jupiter. Meaning by this that the spacecraft, before going to a very cold environment, will go to a very hot environment. And in order to verify 
but the spacecraft is able to survive this hot environment, we needed a strong sun simulator that is only present at STEC in the large space simulator. So we have been there for that reason. The thermal qualification of the spacecraft has been achieved during this test, but during this test we were missing a few flight models of instruments hardware, meaning that the verification that I was mentioning before in vacuum and in temperature conditions of all functional chains of a spacecraft, including the instruments, was only partial at this stage. So we will do a complement of thermal vacuum test in a month uh, in the chamber, which is just close to our clean room. And, we, and this time with everybody on board. Ah, cool. You mentioned uh, you're going to fly near to Venus and Venus is um, <laughs> nearer to the sun than Earth. So uh, the, the thermal environment is harder, especially uh, if you compare it to uh, Jupiter, um, you told me that the main antenna uh, for communication when um, the probe is near to Jupiter has also a shielding reason, right? Indeed, so this high-gain antenna that you can see there uh, is effectively used during the first four or five years of the mission, not at all as an antenna, but as a big sun shield. In fact, this face of a spacecraft will constantly look at the sun during the inner cruise of a journey to Jupiter. Uh, it is a choice that we have made in order to not completely de-optimize the thermal concept of a spacecraft, which is, of course, prim primarily intended to work in a very cold environment. So in order to decouple at the most uh, possible extent what is inside the spacecraft to the external flux coming from the sun around Venus, we, we choose to use this face, and in particular this antenna, as a sun shield, effectively. So, and the communication with Earth, when you're going to point this to the sun, is? A with a medium gain antenna, which you can see, this is the black dish that we can see uh, on top of a spacecraft. This antenna has a dish which is smaller, but it does not matter because we are close to the Earth. So we do not need such a large antenna uh, as where we are around Jupiter. We are closer to the Earth. And this antenna is steerable around two axes. So even with a spacecraft, the, this face of a spacecraft constantly looking at the Sun, we can still maintain the Earth in the field of view of that medium gain antenna. And so when, it's, when this side is going to show to the sun, it's not that optimal to have it on this point, but you're going to need this when the spacecraft is uh, on Jupiter to point to Earth. So this is maybe the reason why the small antenna is also on this side of exactly. the Exactly, so typically when we will do some uh, flybys of Europa, Ganymede and Callisto at Jupiter, uh, we will point the other face of a spacecraft to, to the moons in order to orientate all the optical heads of the instruments to their targets, to the moons, meaning that this large antenna will not be pointed to Earth. So we will also use this medium gain antenna to find the Earth and to maintain a constant communication between the satellite and the Earth when we do this planet, with, uh, these moon flybys at Jupiter. So this brings me to the next question. Um, so you're uh, have, having these flybys, uh, from the moon, or the flyby is around the moons, uh, so you're going to need to point the spacecraft in a special way. Yes. I assume there are several systems to point the spacecraft. Yes, of course. So we have first uh, what we call sensors in order to determine what is the orientation in space of a spacecraft. So for that, we use typically what we call star trackers. So these are cameras that are looking at the sky, recognizing the pattern of stars in order, using a catalog, we, in order to define what portion of the sky the spacecraft is looking to. We have also uh, what we call inertial measurement units. These are used to uh, uh, determine the angular rate of a spacecraft and mixing the information coming from these two sensors, we are able to determine the angular position and the angular rate of a spacecraft at all times. And then once we know where we look to and, and we know where we want to look to, then when we use actuators, so the central software, the software of a spacecraft is generating orders to a number of actuators, basically reaction wheels. This is the hardware that we use to orientate, to, uh, to, to, to direct the field of view of a spacecraft to the target that we want to investigate. So um, they are probably working electrically. So you have this big, big solar arrays uh, for um, generating energy for the instruments, for the um, 
à, à, for all platform equipment, for all, platform all spacecraft equipment. systems are electrically uh, uh, fed, let's say, with electricity coming from the solar panels, effectively. So they will be installed on these two faces. They will be 80, 85 meters squares in total, so that's a very large solar array. For an interplanetary mission, this is the largest solar array we have ever built. But with such a surface at Jupiter, we will only generate 800 watts. It's not so much. So in fact, in designing the electrical concept of a spacecraft, we have really chased every watt that is lost in power converters, in cables, in under-efficiency of electronics design in order to really use to the maximum possible extent the electricity, the power generated from the solar panels for the benefit of the instruments. Of course, everything we do here is for the benefit of the instruments. So, um, 85 square meters, that's around uh, the size of my flat, so uh, maybe that's a, a good comparison. Um, normally for uh, reaction wheels, after some time, you're going to need to desaturate them yes, normally. Exactly. So, um, exactly. I assume Beside the main engine, you're going to have some small yes. engines too. So we have a, a full propulsion subsystem effectively. The main engine is part of it. It is used to execute the largest maneuvers that we will have to execute. In particular, when we will have to insert the spacecraft around Jupiter, we will use the main engine. But effectively, as you said, when the reaction wheels uh, have accumulated a certain level of kinetic momentum, we need to offload them effectively. And for that, we use small thrusters, which you can see underneath the plexiglass covers, covered with some red tags. These are very small thrusters, generating 10 newton of thrust, and we use them to effectively rotate the spacecraft and, and desaturating the wheels at the same time. So the orientation of the spacecraft is kept stable, but the wheels are offloaded by the process. Yeah. And probably the, the orientation of the solar ray race is really important also because you, you need every watt of uh, solar power, yes, right? Yes. So we can orientate the solar panels under one, uh, about one direction. We have a motor that is, a, that is allowing us to orientate uh, the solar panels at best uh, to, the, to, the, to the sun. But still, uh, when we do, for example, uh, uh, moon flybys at Jupiter, at Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, Again, the orientation of a spacecraft will be driven by the areas of focus that the, science, uh, the scientists want to investigate. So the solar panels will not be perfectly directed to the sun. The power consumption of a spacecraft will be maximum because all instruments will be uh, switched on all together to maximize the science return that we collect during this phase. So we have also on board the satellite large batteries that we use to complement the power need of the overall uh, satellite. So during the most, uh, the most uh, power demanding phases of the missions, like flybys, we will use power from the solar panels and from the batteries all together. We talked about the engine, so we, we have these smaller thrusters on the side, a little bit bigger thrusters on uh, the um, downside, the, the side where the payload adapter is, so where it's uh, going to screwed through the uh, Ariane 5. Uh, and inside the payload adapter, there's the main engine, right? Exactly. Um, so you mentioned that for the most um, energetic maneuvers, you're going to need this. Is it also possible to use like the smaller thrusters to yes. compensate? Yes, so effectively, these smaller thrusters that you can see there, these are 20 Newton thrusters. A little bit more than the small A little bigger than the other ones, effectively. So these ones uh, are used effectively for a number of, uh, of reasons, but one of the reasons is to be able to make up for the main engine in case of failure. It is a very unlikely failure, but in case it would happen during a critical insertion maneuver, like at Jupiter, for example, we are able to complete the maneuver using these smaller thrusters. We have a pod of thrusters at each of the four corners of this lower face of a spacecraft, and we can use all of them all together in replacement of the main engine in case of failure to complete a maneuver, yes. And will they use more propellant than the main engine, or is it like similar? No, you are right. In, in case of failure, we are able to complete the maneuver with the thrusters, but there is a penalty. They will over-consume a bit the propellants. So there is a penalty that, that will impact the mission later on. We will have to reduce a few uh, parts of the mission. But the good point is that we have a mission. Yeah. So it is robust to 
again, a very unlikely failure of a main engine. Sir, thank you so much for showing me this one wonderful spacecraft and tell me all of these technical details. Um, it, for me, it's really, really um, the greatest to be here and to see this spacecraft going to Jupiter. It's like amazing. And uh, I think all of the European citizens could be proud sure. about this spacecraft. And thank you and your team so much for building this. You're welcome and thanks for coming.